proto-apnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, there was also a positive history of productive uh, cough of four days prior to presentation. There was no fever, no chest pain, no palpitation. There was associated uh, bilateral leg swelling and uh, nocturia. His past medical history was significant for diabetes of four years. Unfortunately, he was non-compliant with his medications. No prior history of uh, hypertension. He didn't smoke, nor did he drink um, alcohol. He was a frequent patronizer of uh, herbal concussions. So on physical examination, he was a middle-aged man in uh, respiratory uh, distress, evidenced by tachypnea. And there was bilateral pit pedal edema up to the knees. Cardiovascular examination was significant for tachycardia, uh, 91 beats per minute, good volume regular. His blood pressure was elevated. There was um, evident locomotor brachialis. His jugular venous pressure was raised. His apex beats was uh, localized in the sixth left intercostal space lateral to the mid clavicular line, and it had sound of S1, S2, and a ventricular gallop. Chest examination he was tachypneic. The SpO2 was uh, within normal limits. There was crepitations, fine crepitations in the mid and lower lung zones bilaterally. Uh, the abdominal examination was uh, non contributory. So, to start off, what are we thinking of? What is the diagnosis based on this clinical picture we've just uh, put up? Are we considering hypertensive heart disease, knowing that this patient's blood pressure was elevated at presentation? Or are we considering acute exhibition of asthma because he had difficulty in breathing? Or we are thinking of a community acquired pneumonia or chronic kidney disease. Please just, what do you think? Okay, here's the post, please. Okay, uh, it's still moving. But, okay. But a lot of people are going for hypertensive heart disease. Okay, I guess that's why this presentation is very important because we need to understand what heart failure is all about. And heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. So it's based on what the patient presents with. That he, and it's also associated with symptoms. So heart failure is a clinical syndrome with cardinal symptoms like difficulty in breathing or topnia like the patient that was just presented. And then with signs of elevated um, jugular venous pressure, the person could come with pedal edema or tender hepatomegaly. And all this must be as a result of a structural or a functional pathology from the heart. And this is as a result of elevated intracardiac pressure and or inadequate cardiac output. So there's also what is called the universal definition of heart failure. This also helps us to know how to make this diagnosis regardless of the different bodies that have come up with their definitions. And first of all, the clinical syndrome. That's why we need to take a good history to pick out those symptoms that are suggestive of a heart pathology. And then we now have to collaborate it with either an elevated natriuretic peptide, if you can do it from the centers, or you are seeing signs of systemic congestion or pulmonary congestion. Pulmonary congestion that can be gotten from the chest x-ray that is readily available, and then systemic congestion from your examination, you can pick that up. So that tells us, yes, we are dealing with heart failure. But what is of importance also is, in making this diagnosis, you're not just saying, oh, this patient has heart failure. We need to know what the etiology is. We need to know what the precipitant is. And we need to know, know the staging. As we go further, we understand why all these are important, because they all have to be addressed. If not, we just be going around the circle, and the patient won't do well. So um, how significant is heart failure? About 26 million people are actually currently living in heart failure symptoms worldwide. And a large chunk of these um, people with heart failure are actually um, elderly. Uh, it's important for us to appreciate that 50% of our patients that 
have um, heart failure may die in uh, in five years so it's important that we appreciate heart failure for the clinical entity that it is and also um, hone our skills in managing uh, heart failure 80% um, of heart failure body is found in um, uh, people of uh, low and middle income um, countries and um, unfortunately we belong to that um, strata so it's important for us to like I said appreciate heart failure over here we are beginning to see um, patients uh, around um, 50 years and earlier that could also be attributed to um, our reluctance as um, clinicians to diagnose also the reluctance on the part of um, our patients to seek proper health care also as accessibility and other um, um, factors heart failure is also a leading economic body as we know um, a lot of people don't um, patronize um, insurance in nigeria and also our heart failure medications are not cheap also our heart failure is actually it has a very in the lives of our patients because uh, one of the surrogates in which we use to monitor them is actually their quality of life. So you might, as you might imagine, if they're not able to go on with their activities, they might need to uh, vent by buying one or two things, employing one or two people. So it actually has a direct and indirect um, economic burden on our patients. So as we can see, we can appreciate that um, heart failure is actually very, very dangerous. We can see that they have close to a 50% uh, chance of dying within five years. And it's even more lethal than some common malignancies that we uh, fear. Emma. Okay, so as I said earlier on, it's important to know the etiology of heart failure because that will help us know how to address it. So it's not just all about addressing the symptoms. We need to ask questions while we're taking our history and examine appropriately to figure out what could be the cause. And there's a long list. We know hypertension is the major one for us here, and they can present with hypertensive heart disease. But we should also look out for other things. They could also have valvular heart disease. They could come down with other cardiomyopathies. We have the dilated, restricted hypertrophic. Well, the echo would help rule that out, but we need to be thinking about these things when we see these patients. Congenital heart disease, there might be history from childhood, or it could just be the first presentation in a very young adult. So we need to look for this. Coronary artery disease, because patients could come down with ischemic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and the pregnant woman, and then, and the list just goes on and on. We put up this so that we should look for the etiology, because we need to address the etiology. That that would need surgery should be addressed, but we'll get to that during the treatment. And then, apart from the etiology, we need to know this precipitants. As I said, heart failure is not just, oh, he has heart failure and he ends there. No. We need to know what is the etiology. What are the precipitants in this individual? If we don't ask, we won't find it and we won't address it appropriately. And that might just be the trigger to everything we're seeing. These precipitants can be found both in the history taking and the investigations. We need to look out for these things. Does this patient have signs of infection? Does this patient have arrhythmias? Our ECGs will help us with it. Fluid overload. A lot of cases, somebody comes to the hospital, is malaria and typhoid. They're setting up with drip every time. At the end of the day, you're wondering, over and over, you're just treating this person for malaria and typhoid. Nothing else. Every time you set up a drip, the patient becomes breathless. That is another problem. So we need to go beyond, it's not malaria and typhoid anymore. We need to know what else is going on and be mindful of who we give fluids to. Because that person that has hypertension, just that fluid overload might just be that trigger and it will tip the patient to heart failure and then you're struggling with so many other things. Drug compliance, especially those that are supposed to be on hypertensive medication or heart failure drugs, they are not taking their medications very well. You wouldn't know unless you ask until you want you to ask to see these drugs. Alcohol, it's, a, it's very important when you take it in history, you want to know what are they taking and what else alongside the alcohol, substance abuse and all the rest. You want to check for teratoxicosis, is the patient anemic, what other medications has the patient been on? A lot of people take over-the-counter medications, NSAIDs, easily available. A, a lot of older people are trying osteoarthritis, you're taking one instead of the other. At the end of the day, these are the older people that are at higher risk of heart failure and that will still have hypertension along the line 
that are now still taking the NSAIDs and will now come down with heart failure. It is not malaria. We need to act. We need to know what is going on so that we can address it and stop the medication and give them appropriate treatment. So going through the pathophysiology, we just go through it briefly because yes, pathophysiology can be very, very boring, but we just need to understand that this pathophysiology of heart failure helps us know how to manage them. It helps us to know what is going on and the importance of the different medications because the management is targeted at the different pathways of this heart failure. So there are three major pathways for heart failure. We have the sympathetic pathway, and then we have the um, RAS pathway, and then there's the natriuretic peptide pathway. So what happens is once there's an insult to the heart from all the etiologists and the precedents we've talked about, there's reduced cardiac output. The heart says, oh, we need to pump more, but nothing is happening. The stimulation of the sympathetic um, pathway. The sympathetic pathway tries to increase contraction, increase heart rate. All individuals to see how they can increase cardiac output to perfuse the organs. While that is going on, there's uh, reduced um, um, renal output because once there's reduced cardiac output, the renal function too is compromised. It would um, trigger and then they will want to produce, the RAS system is activated, renin is produced, renin acts on angiotensin OG that would then combat it angiotensin 1, then ACE acts on angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 now acts on receptors. All these pathways are important because all our medications like the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs are attacked, they, they try to halt those pathways to prevent the um, sodium water retention that comes from activation of the RAS pathway. Then we have the natri uh, natriuretic peptide system. Once the sympathetic nervous system um, is activated and there's increased contractility, there's um, increased heart rate, the heart, there's increased venous return going back to the heart. So more fluid now goes back to the heart. The heart starts enlarging. The um, ventricles dilate, releasing brain natriuretic peptide. The atrium dilates, increasing atrial natriuretic peptide. All of that is supposed to help, but it doesn't stay long in the system because it's supposed to cause natriuresis and diuresis. So that natriuretic peptide pathway is supposed to like cause a balance, but it doesn't stay long in the system. That's why when we get to the treatment, we understand why we use anin because that's supposed to help that pathway to be sustained to help more natriuresis and diuresis. So we have these questions. Um, the following tests are important in the diagnosis of heart failure, except, so I invite us to go to our polls again. So when we see this patient, what are the investigations we want to do for them? Because these investigations would also help us, as we said, we want to know etiology, we want to know the precipitants, we want to know those things we can correct. So please let's go to the poll. straightforward everybody knew that so back to the investigations okay so these are the investigations that we should try to as much as possible so an echo is very important as we'll discuss later an ECG is actually very very important a chest x-ray uh, there we are know from medical school we are very familiar with the findings that we can see in a chest x-ray in a patient that has heart, heart failure sorry please before we go further ECG is important because if there is no abnormality in the ECG, please think of something else. A patient can present with heart failure and have a normal ECG. There must be something. Even if it's sinus tachycardia or left axis division, left atrial, it must be something. If that ECG is very clean, let's think of something else. Okay. So, uh, N terminal pro BNP is also very important. Uh, especially when we are in the dilemma of knowing whether we are dealing with a cardiac cause of a dyspnea or a respiratory cause. A full blood count and differential. This, we should also be seen looking for uh, differential diagnosis and also precipitants as well. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate can uh, give us a clue if we are dealing with a background and infectious process. 
electrolyte urea and creatinine. Uh, we could be dealing with a cardiorenal syndrome. And as we know, a heart failure does not um, occur in isolation. A patient might also have one or two other comorbidities. Uh, urinalysis, in most of our patients will see, will see uh, proteinuria. It can be a surrogate for systemic uh, congestion. Abdominal pelvic ultrasound. Uh, we can appreciate ascites and other uh, things. Liver congestion, especially for those that are congested, we can see abnormalities in uh, liver um, enzymes. A thyroid function test, you know, um, those with um, thyroid endocrinopathies definitely have um, complications of heart failure as well. So something as little as a TSH is not necessary to do the whole um, thyroid uh, panel. A glycemic profile, okay, we should rule out diabetes. It's a potent risk factor for cardiovascular diseases and also a fasting lipid profile as well. So this was the um, ECG of our patients. Um, I know as we go on and we have our ECG classes, we'll be able to um, go more detail into this ECG, but this patient we can appreciate um, left atrial enlargement and also the um, right axis deviation. Uh, this is the chest x-ray. Can someone um, address the chest x-ray? Anybody in the crowd? Someone just tell us what you can observe, what you want to talk about. This, this chest x-ray, what is it? What's going on? Anyone? Should we call someone? Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, check sex ray is a bit. Okay. The, I can't see the borders of the heart exactly, but it appears to be enlarged. There's cardiomegaly. There appears to be cardiomegaly. There's, I can't physically measure it, but it's. If we measure it, there will be an increased cardiothoracic ratio. So the heart borders and appears enlarged. Um, there's increased vascular markings. So then exactly where? Where do you have the increased vascular markings? Because of the backflow of fluid, uh, pulmonary edema, and also the increased blood pressure. Okay. Thank you very much. So generally, we all know our A, B, C, D, E of um, pulmonary edema or chest x-ray findings. Please, can we just quickly run through them just to remember. A is what? B. C. You're the only one here. <laughs> D. Upper loop diversion. Then E. Nobody said anything at the back over there. What's happening? Are we all together? E is what? Somebody from the other side, please. E is what? Pleural effusion. Okay, so it's important we look out for these things when we say chest x-ray, because that also confirms that, yes, there's pulmonary congestion from heart failure. Okay, so this is the echocardiography finding of a patient that I presented <laughs> earlier. So he possessed the impaired left ventricular systolic um, dysfunction. His ejection fraction ranged between 30 to 35% with eccentric hypertrophy and a moderately enlarged left and right atrium, which is actually consistent with our electrocardiographic finding. So how do we classify heart failure according to ejection fraction? So I'd like us to visit our polls and um, make an attempt. So please let's look at it closely. Let's go to the poll. How do we classify heart failure? Let's remember that it's important because it guides us in managing. It also helps us to monitor the patients. Let's know where they're starting with and where they are as time progresses. So, are we there? Okay, what 
what's going on. No movement. Nobody is. It's not coming on. Okay. Okay, can somebody in the crowd just tell us which one? A, B, C, D. Which one, please? Please be talking. Please can should we call someone? Or are we getting bored? Okay. Okay. Any other response? Are we all supportive of A? This is the second question we're not getting right. We didn't get the first one right. <laughs> I think Please the answer look at it is uh, C. Sorry? I think the answer is C. Percent. Wow. Oh, only four. <laughs> I said I think the answer is C. C. Okay, please, can you explain? What's the difference? We have um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, mildly reduced, reduced. And um, okay, so thank you very much. So as we continue to talk about the classification, it's been changed from mid-range, so it used to be mid-range, but no longer mid-range. It's now seen as mildly reduced. So as we continue, you get to know the difference. Okay, so um, this is how we classify heart failure. It can be based on the injection fraction just like the test we just did. So we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We have heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And we also have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It can be, be also be categorized based on the clinical presentation of our patient in front of us. It can be acute and it can also be chronic. Uh, we also have based on the severity of uh, dyspnea. That is where our New York Heart Association classification comes in and I'm sure we are very conversant with that. Um, then we also have, based on the cardiac dysfunction, based on our American College of Cardiologists uh, staging, and we'll dwell on that as we move uh, further. So um, we have heart failure with reduced eject ejection fraction, and we know that above 50% is how we actually want our patient's heart to be working, but unfortunately those with heart failure uh, don't have that. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the ejection fraction is less than 40%. Um, we also have heart failure with improved ejection fraction. Those were those that had an initial um, ejection fraction of less than 40% and were lucky enough to encounter you and you put them on the appropriate guideline directed uh, medical therapy and you were able to improve the, um, the parameters and you were able to get it above 40%. Then we have um, heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Those are those in which their ejection fraction falls between 41 to 49%. Uh, then we have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Those are those that have heart failure symptoms, but on an echocardiography, um, their um, ejection fraction is greater than 50%. Now, when we're um, talking about um, the functional classification, this I know that we're very conversant with. Uh, we have class one. Those are those that are able to carry out all their physical um, activities. They are actually asymptomatic. That is symptomatic. And um, we have class two, uh, slight limitation of physical activity. These are those that um, they, they can recognize how they were before. Probably they could go from here to the exit point, and now they notice that they can't go to the exit point again without panting, without feeling breathless, without having angina, chest pain, and the likes of that. Uh, then we have class three. These are those with limitation in their physical activity, less than ordinary physical activity. So those trivial activities, something like brushing your teeth, combing your hair, washing plates, they begin to feel breathless. So these patients actually um, fall into class three. Then class four, as we know it, are patients that are dyspneic at address. So our goal as physicians is to try as much as possible to improve the functionality of our patient. And this is actually a good surrogate for us to track where they are and where they are when they have met us. So this is the ACC staging that um, I talked about earlier. Okay, so we have 
um, stage A. These are patients at high risk of developing um, left ventricular dysfunction. These are where patients that have cardiovascular risk factors like your hypertension, your diabetes, obesity, smoking, and um, illicit um, substances. Um, stage B, these are patients with left ventricular dysfunction who haven't developed symptoms. So for whatever reason, they have uh, an echo done and you found that, oh, these patients actually have, have a reduction in their ejection fraction or in the function of their, uh, of their heart. However, they are asymptomatic. At uh, stage C, these are patients that, these are most of the patients that actually we see. These are patients with left ventricular dysfunction and they have phenotypic expression of the um, left ventricular dysfunction. Um, stage D are those, these are those that have symptoms um, at rest. So this um, depicts a harmony of our ACC and our NYHA functional classification. And I'm sure as we can look at it, we can um, appreciate um, where they harmonize. Um, okay. So our Framingham's criteria, I'm sure that, um, or this is rather is the modified Framingham criteria that um, I know definitely medical school I tried to cram. So um, we know that to make a clinical diagnosis of heart failure, we need um, two major criteria, or one major or one or two, uh, one, sorry, one major or two minor criteria. Uh, and we must have ruled out any other medical condition which we could attribute the symptoms in which our patients are presenting with. So we know paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, autopnea, elevated jugular venous pressure, pulmonary crepitations, a third heart sound, a cardiomegaly on chest x-ray like we had in our patients, uh, pulmonary congestions on chest x-ray, and weight loss greater than or equal to 4.5 kilograms in response to treatment to presumed heart failure. We know that most of our patients will be on a loop diuretic, so we should expect some sort of weight loss. So those are uh, major criteria. Then minor criteria are things like uh, bilateral um, leg edema, nocturnal cough, all right, dyspnea on ordinary exertion, hepatomegaly, pleural effusion, um, tachycardia, greater than 120 uh, beats per minute, and weight loss greater than um, or equal to 4.5 kg in five days. So this um, helps to rekindle our memory on uh, Framingham's criteria. All right. So clinical mass manifestations, how will our patients present or how do they present to us? So you can complain of dyspnea, autopnea, all right, by asking them how many pillows they use, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, as a sudden, um, when they suddenly wake up from bed breathless, weakness and fatigue, all right, confusion, headaches, insomnia, tachycardia, crepitations on our physical examination, edema, jaundice, um, alternating weak and strong pulse, that's a pulsus alternance, this is actually a surrogate of left ventricular dysfunction, cool, cold, or clammy extremities, which indicate poor perfusion, jugular venous distension, cyanosis, and a third heart sound. So a constellation of what we can find on our history and our physical examination, we should also be seen looking for all of this. So treatment, how do we treat? All right, so for our patients, which of these um, regimens would you think is appropriate for the patients we talked about? So please, let's go back to the poll. Let's um, choose one, A, B, C, D. How do we treat? We've already started, we started off with a case presentation of a patient that had symptoms suggestive of heart failure. We talked about the investigations. So now, how do we treat? Do we want to use moderatics? Do we want to use calcium channel blockers? Do you want to use methyl Do you want to use the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist? How do we treat? Please, I hope we're all participating. It's not coming on. Okay, if it's not coming on, can somebody just um, tell us which one? 
they will go for. Preferably somebody from that end. I, I mean, that place, everybody's calm, quiet, nobody said anything there. Please, someone should say something. Yeah. We're all learning. Good morning. I'll okay. go for C. Because you have the three of the guideline directed uh, medications, the ARBs, MRA, and SGLT2I. Right. Okay. This is the third question now. Um, okay, that's good. All right, you got this right. Okay. So moving on, treatment. How do we treat our patients with heart failure after we've made a diagnosis? It could either be pharmacological or non-pharmacological. And first of all, we need to understand that it's a multidisciplinary approach for those patients. We need to involve all the subspecialties because they would come with comorbidities. They might need to be seen by a dietitian also. They might need psychotherapy, in the nursing care, pharma the pharmacist, everybody needs to be involved. So it's not just you, the doctor, saying everybody needs to be involved. And we need to look out for those comorbidities that these patients might have and then refer them appropriately. Then we need to counsel them. These patients need to know what they're faced with. They need to be aware of the illness. This helps them to be compliant. This helps them to take their medications well. This helps them to do what you ask them to so say. It's not just all about you telling them, oh, do this, do that. Carry them along, let them understand the reason behind it. Some patients complain that when they ask questions to the doctors, they don't answer them, or they answer them somehow, you know. But please, let us take our time to explain to them. It helps them to be compliant with their medications or whatever you want them to do. Salt fluid intake, we need to reduce their salt intake. Their fluid intake, especially if they are congested. Alcohol, no alcohol at all. Not even small, no red wine, no, nothing, none. Smoking, none. Then there's no, as in they should stop smoking. Exercise what they can tolerate and gradually step it up. Then for the treatment, then for the treatment, we have to consider our major, the major drugs we must give our patients but first of all, we need to understand that we are going to approach it in an individual pattern, meaning what is good for A might not work for B. So we are going to individualize treatment. So it just depends on what you're seeing. This patient, what does this patient have precisely? And the vitals. Our major treatments are... MRAs, that's the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, that's our spironolactone and eclerinone. The second is our beta blockers. We now have the SGLT2 that come in dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, and then we now have the anin or the RAS blockers. The anin are the, are the RAS blockers, either the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs, or what we all know as Uperio, which consists of sacobitril, vasatan, is what is used for heart failure. Those are our four major key pillars of heart failure treatment. But as I said earlier on, you have to profile the patient. Not every one of them might be on these medications, but that is your target. So it's just based on what you can see. If this patient has... Um, a high heart rate, you know that yes, this patient is having tachycardia, you know your beta blockers should be there. If this patient has a high blood pressure, it gives room for so many things. You want to put in all the medications gradually, but you want to attain that during that period of admission. But remember that this patient can also have cardiorenal syndrome. The potassium might be elevated. So it's not this patient that you now place on spironolactone when we know it's a potassium sparing medication. So that's why I said we have to look at the patient critically based on the investigations we've done to know what is appropriate. And then also our anin. We know it's uh, either the ACE, the ARBs, or Uperio, preferably Uperio. But we know because of cost and all that, if they can't afford Uperio, we can still do our ACE or ARBs. And it's important we start all these medications as soon as possible. But remember, 
we have to look out for other comorbidities. If this patient has arrhythmias or AFib, you know you will add other medications. You're thinking of anticoagulation for this patient. If this patient has maybe um, a valvular heart disease, you know that it's not just a heart failure that is a problem. There's something that has caused it and you need to address it surgically. If this patient has ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, that has to be sorted out also. May patient benefit from stenting and all the rest. So that's why we keep emphasizing etiology precipitant. You need to look for those things and address it so that other medications are alongside our four major drugs will be given. Then it's important you admit this patient because you want this patient to be on bed rest. First of all, as much as possible, let the person rest. And then while the patient is on bed rest, you want to give your prophylactic clexate because the patient is not ambulating and you don't want to have other issues on your hands like venous thromboembolism. So you want to give your um, prophylactic lexin. Except there are other indications like when the patient has AFib and you want to do your full anticoagulation for them, which is another um, topic entirely. But we for don't forget we need to address every aspect. And the reasons why those four drugs are important is because they've been shown to improve morbidity and mortality they reduce morbidity and mortality. So it's important because all we just want to do is reduce the progression of heart failure. The harm has ha occurred, but let's see how we can reduce the progression. So all these medications are important, and especially the SGLT2 inhibitors that are now new, you can use them both in reduced and preserved ejection fraction. So it is very good for our patients. And much more to whether they are diabetic or not, because the drug is a known diabetic medication. But while the study was on ongoing, they realized that it had some cardiovascular benefits. And gradually, it is now a heart failure medication now. So it's important we place this patient on these medications. And as we said, hypertension, we need to address it with all these drugs, because these drugs will also lower blood pressure. We also need to look out for the cholesterol. We already said that this patient is not just only heart failure. There are other things this patient might have. If there's um, um, deranged or elevated cholesterol, we need to address it. Glycemic control, we need to look out for these things because we, are, we know that this hypertensive patient could also be diabetic. Then if there are other precipitants, if there's an infection, you need to address it. Give your antibiotics appropriately. If you are dealing with fluid overload, you know you need to stop it and arrest the patient. If there are electrolyte derangement, depending on which one, you know you need to address the electrolyte. You're looking out for your potassium and all the rest, you need to address it. If there are arrhythmias, your ACG will help you out and you address it with your antiarrhythmic drugs. Then the patient could also have, uh, the, the patient could be obese. We need to address that. They need counseling, lifestyle modification. Uh, if they have um, COPD, that also needs to be addressed. As we said earlier on, it's a multidisciplinary approach where we need to refer appropriately. We need to refer, but if you don't look out for these things, you will know who to refer to. Then device therapy. Device therapy, a lot of people stop just at medical care, but we need to understand that there's room for device therapy. It's available, we are doing it, and we are seeing a lot of successes with it. So when it gets to that point, we'll still talk about device therapy. We should offer it to the patients. Then we need to monitor them, look out for complications, and follow them up. And psychotherapy is very important. They can be depressed. It's not easy. Somebody that is up and about all of a sudden can't move around like he used to. Some of them don't just understand why they have to be on these drugs for life. It affects them psychologically, and it affects them. You need to look out for these things, address it, and if you, need, they need, if you think they need psychiatry evaluation, they should be offered, because that would also help them. Then rehabilitation, depending on how or what they're faced with, if they're, they can still move around. Some of them can't even do their jobs anymore. What else can they do? One needs to offer them other options. And I, we keep saying we need to educate, educate our patient. It really helps. When an individual knows what they're faced with and the complications that can come if they don't take their drugs and what they can prevent when they do it, they would adhere. It's not easy, but people can't... You know what's like taking drugs for life? It's not easy. Even anti-malaria, some of us, we don't finish it for three days. Just three days is a problem. Then you're telling someone to take drugs for life. It's not easy. But if you're able to explain to them, let them understand the implications, they would do it. Then let them also know the signs to look out for. Not just buying drugs over the counter because it's readily available. Once there's any problem, they need to come back to the hospital. Some of these medications we give them, oh, I'm coughing, they go and take macrolides. Or oh, that's... Uh, Acetromycin, all of that is available. But this cause um, QT prolongation, which they are prone to, 
prone to arrhythmias. So some of these things, if they don't come to the hospital, they wouldn't know. They just take drugs anyhow, and then they have worsening of symptoms, and they can't explain why. So if they have any problem, any medical condition, they should come back to the hospital for proper evaluation and treatment. And then low sodium diet. Low sodium diet, it also helps them. They should cut down their sodium intake. Also, there are different, um, there are different ways the heart failure patients can present, and we need to look out for these things. Sometimes they could come in just, okay, the straightforward ones, they have the um, symptoms we talked about, we can investigate them, we do nitratic peptide, it's markedly elevated, we treat. There are times when they might come in congested. So your focus at that point in time is to direct them as much as possible while you're gradually introducing the four major pillars of our medications that we've all talked about. There are times when they will come in in pulmonary edema, their chest is congested. They might not even have um, pedal edema or tender hepatomegaly, just their chest that is congested. So you know your focus at that point in time, surely with elevated blood pressure, is to sort out the diuresis. So you just need to individualize your care for that patient based on the presentation. And then when they come in cardiogenic shock, that is not when we are thinking of putting your perio. That's the way we are thinking of doing all the um, beta blockers or MRAs. What you want to do now is you want to give your inotropes to see how you can support them. Sometimes they have to be admitted in the ICU for mechanical circulatory support. So it's still based on individualizing your care based on what the patient presents with. But look out for these things. If it's cardiogenic shock, know that your target at that point in time is to give inotropes to see how you can titrate their blood pressure before you start giving drugs that can be of help in heart failure. So going through the devices quickly, we need to know that these devices are available and know when this patient needs it so that you can refer them appropriately if you don't have it in your center. Pacemakers, we use it most of the time for patients that have symptomatic bradycardia or AV block, third degree, or Mobis type 2. Once, they might not present in heart failure, but if they do present in heart failure, we know that, yes, this is available and they can be offered. We also do implantation ICDs and CRTs. Um, before we go into that, let us present a case so that you understand when to prescribe or recommend these devices. Okay, so we have an 80-year-old man with diabetes, hypertension for over 20 years, also has a background history of chronic kidney disease and heart failure. He presented to our emergency department with worsening of his heart failure symptoms. So he already knew he had heart failure. So the predominant symptoms were dyspnea with autopnea and early satiety. So on physical examination, when he presented, there was significant bilateral pit in pedal edema extending to the knee, fine by basal crepitations on chest examination. His N-terminal pro-BMP was markedly elevated as displayed. Urinalysis showed um, a plus of protein. On his electrolyte urea and creatinine, his creatinine was at 1.5 milligram per deciliter, which is elevated. Um, his ECG and Holter ECG revealed um, polymorphic ventricular complexes, long grades three to four. His echo um, showed um, an ejection fraction of 22%. He subsequently had a coronary angiography, which revealed normal coronary arteries. So this was his um, ECG on presentation and the ER. So for emphasis, this is our own patient that we are managing. So it's a life case. It's not something we just hooked up. This is a patient we are managing. And at the end of the day, we had to insert an ICD for this patient. And along the line, because this patient was on guideline-directed medical therapy, was on all the medications re required, but still was still symptomatic. We then had to do an, uh, place an ICD for this patient. And somewhere along the line, because this was done early part of this year, somewhere along the line, the patient had a syncopal attack. Just for some few seconds, the wife said, she just noticed it was unresponsive, and then later on, he was able to talk. And we had to interrogate the ICD and we realized that he actually had a ventricular fibrillation at that point in time when it happened. And he had a shock from the ICD. And that was just life saving for him. And that was what helped him. And till now, we are still seeing him on follow up basis. And he's doing well. So you can understand that it just didn't stop at just medical therapy. There was need for ICD. I can imagine if we didn't fix that ICD, what would have happened to him? So going further, We've talked about the indications of pacemakers. You, ha you have the slides later on, so you can go through it 
but generally symptomatic bradycardia as we mentioned earlier on. And then we talked about the need for ICD. For ICD, before you talk about putting a device for this patient, the patient should be on medical therapy for at least three months and is still symptomatic. And the EF is still less than 35%. And you know that this, you expect the patient's life to still be prolonged for more than one year. So it's not somebody that you know that for whatever reason has other comorbidities that's going to die within less than one year that you are talking about. This is somebody that still have a prolonged lifespan. EF is still less than 35%, still symptomatic, despite being on guideline directed medical therapy. Then, and it's in NYHA 2-3, then consider ICD. We can go through this later on. Then there's room for CRT, especially when the cure is complex. It's more than 130 milliseconds, much more when it's more than 150. The patient is still symptomatic. EF less than 35%. Still on guideline directed medical therapy. Emphasis on the patient should be on guideline medical therapy because that is very important. And it's still symptomatic. You do your ECG, QRS complex is, the QRS complex is very broad then consider CRT. We offer it in cardio care. Our patients are doing well on this medication, on this um, device therapy alongside their guideline directed medical therapy. This is a table to just let us know when to request or request for ICD or CRT for our patients. So this is also like, um, this is the ESC guidelines. We can also look at it later on where we have the slides. So please, I would like us to go back again to the very first question because we didn't get the answer and it's so important because that's the whole idea of this presentation. Diagnosis, we need to make appropriate diagnosis so that we can know how to treat appropriately. I'm hoping that we now have a clearer picture of what heart failure is all about. So we should get this question now. <laughs> So please, can we go to the pool and answer this? I think this was the previous one, or is it? Okay, all right. Please, are we there, or do we need assistance? Are we there? Are we there? Yeah. Oh, we need to refresh. But it's changing slowly. Because <laughs> I want to make sure that people are not still <laughs> going with the first. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 So please, can somebody just tell us what the answer is? Okay, ah, okay, I feel better. Oh, okay, well, we're not yet there, Sha. <laughs> it can't be 50-50. <laughs> oh, BVF is biventricular failure, sorry. <laughs> Secondary to hypertensive heart disease. <laughs> Respected by severely elevated blood pressure. I had to abbreviate it because it will occupy the whole screen. Okay, thank you very much. So in conclusion, we all now know what heart failure is all about. And I'm hoping that we can make appropriate diagnosis, looking out for etiology, precipitants, and knowing that this patient also would benefit from device care when needed. So heart failure is a chronic condition. Good history and physical examination is very important because that's the only way we would know what it is and be able to address it. And don't forget a guideline directed medical therapy. It's important. This is not time for methyl dopa or all the rest. Those ones that we need that will benefit. We've talked about the SGLT2 inhibitors. We've talked about the MRAs, our RAS blockers. That's the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or 
um, Uperio, that's the ANI, and beta blockers. And it's a multidisciplinary approach that should be taken. Thank you very much. So we'll take a few questions. How many people saw the joxin here? Yes, anybody see the joxin? Or sloke? Yes? Did they make a mistake? Come, you have not gone on, you have seen questions. Or what? Or not B. Or Selgevity. I, I, I mean, sorry, oh, sorry. I hope the consular companies are not here. <laughs> Anybody see any of those things? No. Okay, so you can see that the, the approach to heart failure has changed significantly. Are there questions? Are there questions? Dr. Inouye is here. Dr. Inouye is one of our consultant cardiologists at Cardio Care. Yes, please. And there's somebody at the back, too. Okay. Okay. Um, thank By you very way, much for the way, ICD means implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which we put in just the same way we put in like a pacemaker under the skin and we connect it to the heart. And um, it picks up those things that will have caused sudden death and then shocks the person. So that was an example of somebody that will have died if he did not have a device in. And one of the most common indications is when the ejection fraction is less than 35%, despite adequate medical therapy you typically should have those patients. That's one of the most common. You typically should have that in there to prevent primarily sudden cardiac deaths. Now, if somebody has had a cardiac arrest too, in, and they're in heart failure, and you successfully resuscitated them, they need to also have the ICD for secondary prevention. So those are the things, those are the most common reasons. So please, if you successfully, say I successfully resuscitated the person, great. Now refer them um, so that uh, we can put in the ICD. Uh, before we go ahead, I want to recognize this, the CMD of FMC Kefi, uh, one of our great teachers and senior colleagues, Dr. Yaya Adamu. <laughs> Welcome, sir. He's here. He's coming and put a device um, uh, during the International Cardiology Symposium. He was there. We did a device together. Very, um, I really appreciate you, sir, and I'm very happy he came. Okay, so questions briefly, and then... Okay, so um, thank you very much for the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chijo Keotiba. Um, a physiotherapist currently interning at National Hospital. So what you said about, you know, it's clear that this is a multi, you know, you take a multidisciplinary approach to this, and it's been common practice not to usually get referrals for cases like this on time. So I wanted to know to you, what is the best practice for referral to physical therapy, exercise rehabilitation programs? How early should you refer, or how early should you invite that aspect, that wing of the multidisciplinary team for management. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, okay, as I keep saying, you just need to individualize your patients because it depends on the NYHA classification they present with. Some might be so dysnic. That's not the person you are saying, oh, jog or walk and all the rest. But as soon as they are out of that acute phase, as soon as they're out of the acute phase, they're no longer breathless. Because sometimes they will even tell you, even to go to the bathroom is a problem. To take their bath, to dress up is a problem. Any slight work is a problem. But once they're out of that acute phase, with your medications appropriately given, then you can commence the exercise because it's needed. Lifestyle modification is important. Physiotherapy is important you need to start exercise as soon as they can tolerate it. So it depends on the patient. That will determine what next you want to do. But just know that these are the things you should offer so that when the time comes, you know what next to do. So once the patient is NYK2, preferably, or sometimes even from NYK3, that is that they can, at least at rest, they should not be breathless. Now, the physical therapy or any form of physical exertion should be symptom limited. Meaning that you, anytime the patient feels symptoms, you must stop and rest. So what typically will happen is that it will take a long time. So you do small, the patient feels, you do wait. The patient gets rec recovered, then you'll now do a little bit. 
Another way to determine the patients that will be qualified that will qualify is by their six minute walk test. So when patients have heart failure, in any way you are, it's free. Walking is free, Abby. You can ask the patient to walk for um, six minutes and you measure the distance that they can walk. Typically, you should have pre-measured the ground and then they can walk back and front. Put chairs on the way, on the step, so that once they get tired, they can sit down and rest. Measure the six minutes time. Typically, if I'm not mistaken, it's 25 to 30 meters. Once they can do 25 to 30 meters and above, I'll confirm it again, then you think, number one, they have a better prognosis, and number two, they should, you should start considering. So from NYK3. Um, finally, it is also important that the physical therapist also understand the heart failure. So that is where there has always been a problem. If the physical therapist does not understand heart failure, then they start doing stroke uh, rehabilitation. Okay, so that becomes a problem. Now, one of the ways we also do in cardio care is that your treadmill, the treadmill you use for your stress ECG, there is a program for rehabilitation, in which case you put the electrodes, you watch the, elect the ECG and we will learn about ECG. You should monitor the ECG during that period and then be able to identify if there are issues that, you, that that therapy is inappropriate for them. So those are the things. And then finally, you must get the clearance from the cardiologist at when to start. But the earlier you start physical therapy, the better for quality of life, the better for occupational rehabilitation. We have loads of patients working at different levels, but once you're able to get on these things, yes, physical therapy is really very low for cardiac rehabilitation generally. It's very low, and we have very, very few. I don't know any physiotherapist that has specialized in cardiac rehabilitation. Post-surgery, after we put a stent, after we have a device, there are very few. Of course, this is what we are doing. So by the time we can have some of them, we can now work together, teach, and then they can now work with us. Thank you. Somebody had a question? Yeah. Somebody had a question? OK. I am Ajia Grace, nurse from Federal Medical Center, Kefi. We have a patient that um, was diagnosed of having hypertension about 30 years ago and was not really regular on her medication. In 2007, she came down with CCF secondary to hypertensive heart disease. That's about 15 years ago. Since then, she has been regular on her drugs and her clinic visits, that's her appointment. But up till now, um, she's on diuresis, that's uh, frusemide and spironolactone. She's on um, and telmisartan and other anticoagulants, clopidogrel. But she's still having pulmonary congestion and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, severe one, as at now. And, I don't, and she's dry because she, she's not having edema. In fact, she's even complaining of symptoms that, um, uh, of dehydration because she complained of dry mouth and throat, but she's still having uh, pulmonary congestion and severe paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. What else can we do to help this patient improve her condition? Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. First of all, I would recommend refer her to cardio care. <laughs> Dr. So Shidali is in, is in FMC Kefi, yes, if I remember. So Dr. Shidali, if you see the patient, Dr. Shidali is my very good friend. Okay, because it's very important to know precisely what medications she's taking, at what dose, titrating it up to a tolerable dose for her, following the guideline directed medical therapy. Then we can repeat our echo, let's know what it is. Is the EF still less than 35%? And then, if that is so, then does she qualify for ICD, which we just talked about, as implantable cardiac defibrillator? Does she qualify for that? We do it, and we can offer it to her. Or does she qualify for CRT, depending on what she presents with and what the ECG is like? If the QRS complex is broad, and we see that she'll benefit from CRT, why not we'll fix that for her? So that's why I said refer her to us, and let's sort her out. So there are, um, from, the t from the drugs you called, um, so, do you remember the presentation she said? What other drugs is, she, is that patient not on? Yes? Who can remember? The patient is not on SGLT2 inhibitors. The patient is not on ANI. The patient is not on beta blockers. No, it's on, it's on spironolactone, she said. It's on spironolactone, yes. So, the patient is not on 
on SGLT inhibitors, the pressure is not on ionized, the pressure is not on beta blockers. You cannot really win without those drugs. The evidence is glaring. Now, I will put a caveat, those drugs are not cheap. Okay, so um, it's also, and so they are less likely to be in smaller towns. So the pharmaceutical companies typically live there in Abuja, Lagos. So it, be, it may be difficult for you to find it in some areas. I will, not, I will not lie to you. Okay, we have some of them that are around and that we present, I think Novartis, Basic, that have some generic um, ones that can be used. But that patient needs to be optimized. Those drugs must come in. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to have those drugs come in at the patient at home. You need to admit that patient and start adding the drugs properly and gradually. Now, if you have done all of that and the patient is still remaining, you should begin to consider whether that patient is a, is a, will qualify for biventricular pacing. That's CRT. In the CRT, we put a lead into the right ventricle, a lead into the left ventricle, and have the both ventricles, you know, well, not directly into the left ventricle, but through the coronary sinus. But, and have both ventricles, you know, harness both their power together to push the heart better. And the patient will get a lot of improvement. So first thing first, the, the therapy needs to be optimized. And anise are not there. What are the anise? The drug typically is called, I mean, is sacubitril valsartan. Sacubitril valsartan. So if you ask me, the telmisartan should go and should replace with sacubitril valsartan. So if you ask Dr. Shidali, he will do that. Then... Beta blockers must come in. Beta blockers must come in. Then the SGLT inhibitors also, empaduflozine, um, should come in, and they are available. Typically, you start with 10 milligrams, check the blood, blood pressure, repeat the echo like she has said, do all those other things. But if you don't add those things, you are, not, you are unlikely to get very good outcome. Okay, so frusemide is not enough. Frusemide is not enough. Be drying up the patient is not enough. As soon as you dry that patient, the next thing you should have the opportunity to do is to put your beta blocker. Now, number two, if you dry the patient and you continue wiping the patient with fusemide, chances are you are going to cause hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is a, another reason why the heart will not recover well. Okay, so when the patient is dry, you may need to cut down the fusemide a bit and monitor those electrolytes. If the, if the hyponatremia is there, you will walk or you will do everything. The patient will not get better. Okay? And the hyponatremia and heart failure is a serious question. Somebody has a question here. So it, I advise that um, for the nurses and the other people in the hall, I know clinics in the public hospitals are very busy. There are some patients that must see yoga. Then there are the other ones that just came with uh, 14090. Uh, they should not come and waste and didn't get August time. So those patients must see the main that patient must be managed at specialist level. Thank you for your presentation and contribution. What was the dividing line between acute and chronic? Is there a time frame? Is there a time frame or something? Acute and chronic heart failure classification. Thank you. Then for the ICDs, what is the range, the price range we should tell patients? Because they'll definitely ask you in a public hospital doctor, how much? So what do we tell them? Thank you. Okay, the question is acute and chronic heart failure. So for starters, heart failure is chronic. Okay? So heart failure is chronic. What we mean by acute heart failure is just an acute decompensation. So heart failure by definition is a chronic disease. It's invariably progressive. So you cannot say somebody has heart failure now and they come and give testimony that now they are cured. Uh -huh. No, it's not one of those kind of things. It's invariably progressive in a lot of cases. The exception may be peripatal cardiac myopathy. Okay? So when we say acute heart failure, what we are saying is that this patient now has NYHA class 4. Something precipitated. The blood pressure went very high. They had an arrhythmia. They are now breathless. They had to come to the hospital. You had to give all of that. That's what we mean by acute heart failure. Those are the ones you're not trying to do physiotherapy for. You're not trying to, you know, play around with. So that's what we mean by the acute heart failure. But generally, heart failure is chronic by definition. The second question is the cost of um, ICDs. Um, so there are two. The only ones we use now, at least in cardio care, are the MRI-compatible ICDs. Uh, that's what we prefer. And there are two types, single chamber and dual chamber. Now, the ICD can become a pacemaker itself. 
It can also defibrillate. It can cardiovascular. So it can do so many things. So an ICD is more expensive than a regular pacemaker because it can do all of that. It depends now whether you are choosing a single chamber or a double chamber. Okay, so if you think that this patient may develop an AV block in future, or you can see some of those signs, you should put a dual chamber. Okay, and you think that there are other issues, you should put a dual chamber. If you are just putting for primary prevention, then a single chamber will be okay. Single chamber pacemaker should, I'm not sure, maybe around two to three million. Double chamber should be around four to five million. Something about that. Okay. Now, can we do without it? Maybe. But what will, have, what will have happened will have been, for that patient that we talked about, will have been BIDRB. Yeah, so uh, we know from the studies from Europe that there is a significant difference in quantity of life and quality of life, as much as six to seven years difference. So that person is coming for follow-up today. If there's a man we put on Friday, by Sunday he had a shock. You can imagine, you know, what would have been. So you should just wait. Offer the patients the best. Otherwise, you know, they travel actually. They travel and they say, what kind of, uh, why didn't you offer them this? So offer the patients the best. The ones that cannot afford it, optimize their medical therapy. And then one day they will afford it. Now we also have a, a program with the University of Michigan and um, an, an NGO in the UK um, where we offer um, reconditioned pacemakers and ICDs. So reused ICDs. Okay, so that is a lot cheaper. Maybe almost 60%, 70% cheaper than the normal one. So it can be very low for that one. So if a patient cannot afford it um, or they are willing, they can't get, uh, so it is reconditioned. The ICD was used by somebody else. It was sent back to the factory, re-sterilized, and the battery was pumped up back to almost the same level, and we are running a study currently, uh, back to the same level, and then we can use it for people that can't afford it. Sometimes 750,000, 100, 1 million, we put it, we can't afford it at least. It's there, and it works, it works normally, okay? Almost all of us are using second-hand cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. If okay. you are using a new car, I'm not sure you're a doctor. <laughs> hello, hello. Yes, hello, please. sir. No oh, well, our next, our next one will bring a banker to come and talk to us about the effect of, of cardiovascular health. Please, can somebody give, give him a mic? Okay, somebody else. Oh, sorry. Good. Okay, good day, sir. Um, my question is, um, I can recall some time ago there was a, there was a what do you say, a guideline that was put in place, um, advising against the use of beta blockers in acute decompensated heart failure. Um, the reason being that the negatively their beta blockers are negatively inotropic and chronotropic, so would further worsen the cardiac output of the patient. So uh, for, a, for a patient who had uh, acute decompensated heart failure, which was the trigger for going into CCF, I would like to ask, are there any specific clinical and or laboratory parameters f that we can use to guide our initiation of beta blockers in this therapy since beta blockers have a known mortality and mobility benefits in the management of heart failure. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, initially, yes, beta blockers were said not to be used in heart failure, but now, based on the ESC 2021, the latest guideline, you can use it, but there's a caveat. It should be used once the patient is off the acute phase. Once you've dried up the patient, you can use it or except, except there are other indications for the beta blocker. If this patient is coming with atrial fibrillation and heart failure, you need to slow down the heart because that will worsen the heart failure. So that is another indication for the use of beta blocker, even in heart failure. If the patient has other arrhythmias, like you do an altar and all the rest, and you can see the patient has other arrhythmias and would benefit from beta blocker, yes, you can. But in the acute phase, when the patient comes, congested and all the rest. That is not when you want to start the beta blockers. But along the line, before the patient is discharged, that means the patient is now stable, then you can commence your beta blockers because we all know now that beta blockers is effective. It helps reduce morbidity and mortality. And the sooner you introduce it, the better for the patient. But let me just add, beta blocker does not include propanol law because sometimes when we finish, we don't have people who prescribe propanol. No. Or attend a law leader. 
please. That's not what we mean by beta blockers and heart failure. So if you come around patients that are with heart failure and are on those drugs, please stop them. They will worsen outcome. For those ones that when you want to start, typically, make sure we say make sure they are euvolemic. That is, you should have dried them up significantly. If they were on beta blockers before they decompensated, do not stop. Do not stop. You may reduce the dose as much as possible, except the other contraindications. But while they are there, once you have been able to get them dry a little bit, downgrade them from NYHA4, maybe to NYHA3, you can start at a low dose. Start always low. So you typically start from the lowest dose. So if you're starting bisoprolol, 1.25 or 2.5 milligrams, and you grow slowly. If you're doing carbidolol, 3.125, you know, and then you grow slowly. If you are doing uh, metoprolol, 25 milligrams, metoprolol succinate, not metoprolol tartrate. Please remember that. Metoprolol succinate. Okay, sometimes when you prescribe metoprolol, they go to the pharmacy, the pharmacy gives them whatever it is. Metoprolol succinate, not metoprolol tartrate. Succinate is the long acting, slow acting one. That's the one that it has more benefit. Nebivolol is also good. So, carbidolol, bisoprolol, metoprolol, nebivolol. So, BC never enters a car, Abby, meta three times. <laughs> All right, do we understand? Remember those drugs BC, bisoprolol, carbidolol, metoprolol, and the metoprolol succinate, uh, which I have not mentioned, nebivolol. So please let's remember those drugs. Those are the beta blockers we're talking about. And you start at the lowest dose and you gradually optitrate. You optitrate to the maximum tolerable dose. So if you start small and you say, okay, they are now beta blockers, they are fine. Like the patient we're talking about from the hospital that you talked about. What you do, you must keep on getting, increasing till you get to the maximum tolerable dose. For carbidolol, you can get as much as 50 milligrams twice a day or 25 milligrams twice a day. For metoprolol, you should get to 200 milligrams. For bisoprolol, you should get to 10. Okay, so those are, the, you must keep on increasing them till you get to the maximum um, tolerable dose, how much they can tolerate. Okay, I hope that helps to answer that question. So the patient comes in, <laughs> sweating everywhere. Don't say, ah, we learned from uh, ACS. It's not here. It's not here. Uh -huh. Yes, any other questions? We take one last question. Good, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma. Um, my question is actually a hypothetical um, scenario. Let's say we have a patient who has heart failure and um, diabetes as a comorbidity, and they come down with a hyperglycemic emergency, considering the fact that one of the principles of management involves fluid resuscitation, how would we go about it knowing that they have um, heart failure? Those are the sweet cases, Abby. Those are the cases that separate men from boys. <laughs> okay, um, so typically what we do is this is one of the cases you cannot mention you cannot you should not uh, manage without a specialist number one i think i should just say that up front you should not manage a specialist you should not manage in the open world you should try as much as possible to manage in an icu setting and the reason is simple you typically have to put in a central venous line and measure their central venous pressure you use that central venous pressure to help you guide fluid therapy so that you know when you are going too much or too little but you must